Hey everybody, Matthew Collar and Sam Ekstrom here in an empty U.S. Bank Stadium following what will be known for a very long time as the Cooper Rush game. The Minnesota Vikings lose 20-16 to to Cooper Rush and the Dallas Cowboys on Sunday Night Football in a game that I don't think I ever believed the Minnesota Vikings would actually lose because... Cooper Rush kept throwing interceptions and fumbling and struggling until he got an opportunity for a final drive, which he cashed in on thanks to two incredible catches by Amari Cooper to beat the Minnesota Vikings, who then did not put up much of a fight on a final drive. The Vikings now drop to three and four. And Sam, where do you want to start with this one? I mean, this is among the annals of great Minnesota Vikings disappointments ever. It's worse than Matt Moore. It's worse than Chase Daniel. It's worse than Andy Dalton. This was not your typical backup. This was a backup that had never played before in a meaningful game. In many years of NFL service, I didn't know who Cooper Rush was until I think Wednesday, maybe Thursday, when there was kind of the first whisper that maybe Dak's not going to play. I looked it up. Cooper Rush was their backup. He did not enter my consciousness until then, and he just beat the Minnesota Vikings in a football game. And I think there's a there's an idiom about blind squirrels and nuts. Like, you're going to find one once in a while. Even if you're a bad quarterback, an inexperienced quarterback, you're going to connect on some passes inevitably if you throw 40, 45 of them. And that's what happened. He connected on just a couple passes, and that was all it took to get his team in this game because the Vikings would not could not, refused to take advantage of the many gifts they were given. Two turnovers by Cooper Rush, myriad punts, some short fields. The Vikings go 1-14 of 14 on third down. They don't score off of two turnovers. They don't score on first and goal, or they have a field goal, first and goal at the four when they really wanted a touchdown. Um, so many inept offensive moments that I can't even be that upset when the defense gives up a touchdown late. I mean, you should never have been in that position. Well, no, that's exactly what I was going to say is that the story that comes out of tonight is, of course, Cooper Rush is going to get all the headlines. We will be using some puns. Uh, Rush Hour, for example, or if you're a classic rock fan, you could say the Vikings let down in the limelight. Am I right? Was this a color yeah, rush game? Was, uh, it was not a color oh, rush Oh, that game. would have been fun. Just a rush game is what it was. <laughs> but uh, really the story coming out, though, is the Minnesota Vikings offense refuses to score in the second half of football games. Uh, that each game this year, they have struggled in the second half outside of Carolina where they got down late in the game and then were forced to be aggressive. But today, even when they tried to be aggressive and set receivers down the field, it often still resulted in checkdowns. And I think that the frustration with an offense that is inherently conservative and inherently built to protect Kirk Cousins, that anytime they aren't able to run the football like they didn't really do tonight, um, successfully. They didn't break out many big runs from Delvin Cook. His average overall was okay, but he didn't take over the game like Delvin Cook is known to do. And anytime it seems the opposing team has a good defensive line, the Vikings offensive line, which had showed signs of progress, it seems to come apart. It happened against the Cleveland Browns, and it happened tonight against the Dallas Cowboys. Randy Gregory specifically really took over this game. And Sam, we like to search for solutions on the show and on our podcast. We talk about, well, maybe they should do this or that, or this is what the statistics say, or here's an idea that I had that might be a little crazy. But I don't know what the solution to this is. It seems like it is their identity as a football team that they are going to have these long stretches of inconsistency. And even though they are still in the thick of the playoff race, uh, they have a lot of work to do to figure out how to get more consistent offensive play so they don't end up losing a game to Cooper Rush. The Vikings are me when I go to a casino. Um, the house is always going to win. And you, you walk in and every game you play, you're at a disadvantage, but you can still get hot once in a while. You might be a 40% 40 chance to win every game you play. And with those odds, yeah, you're going to string some together. But over the long haul, you're going to lose more than you win because the advantages of the house catch up to you. Um, in this case, the house is like everything about Kirk Cousins. It's the the games that he just doesn't show up for. 
um, tonight being among them. And frankly, three of the last four have been very below average Kirk Cousins performances. The Vikings were lucky to beat Detroit, but they lost to Cleveland with that type of performance, and they lose today against Dallas. Um, it, we continue to see these pop-up games from Kirk where he regresses to the worst version of himself. It's been really hard to raise the floor on Kirk. And I think there were a couple of the first three games this year, people thought, hey, this is it. We've done it. We've cracked the code, only to come crashing back to reality in three of these last four. And uh, speaking of three and four, those are the, that's the record. That's what you are. And I think, I think you deserve the record. I mean, I think yep. if people were trying to convince themselves, hey, this team should be five and one, this game that we just watched, I think that tells you that you are what your record is, and that is fringe playoff team. And I mean fringy. Um, you're lumped in with Atlanta, San Francisco, Chicago, Seattle. Um, you're going to be battling nip and tuck just to be a seven seed. Yeah, and if they had won tonight, we were not going to, as uh, what Denny once said, crown them because it was Cooper Rush. If they had beaten a team that had Dak Prescott on the field, then maybe it would have been much more of a statement. But this was sort of a survive in advance and then go on to Baltimore, go on to Los Angeles, and then face off with the Green Bay Packers here with a chance to stay in the thick of that race as opposed to, like you said, dropping back into the teams that sort of define mediocrity in the NFC. And Sam, tonight it felt like Clint Kubiak tried a lot of different things. In fact, even Mike Zimmer said that they had a different script to come out of the second half, which is a thing that they've been doing in recent weeks. Uh, but nothing seemed to come to fruition. They tried to throw short, quick passes. They tried to run the bootlegs. They tried to move the pocket like they actually did successfully at times in the second half of the Carolina game. And nothing really seemed to work. And, and I think what it comes back to is that Vikings fans have just seen this movie so many times that there has to be an extremely high level of frustration to have gone into this game thinking, all right, what a break. In a season where it started out with bad breaks, there's been a lot of good ones recently. They've been healthy and they've had, which we'll get to in a second, uh, they've been healthy. They've had a 54-yard field goal go in to win a game. They won a coin toss to beat Carolina. And then they win the lottery, as you were talking about with the casino. And they get Dak Prescott on the sideline, one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL, and yet still unable to figure out any way to beat the pass rush of the Dallas Cowboys. It really takes down the level of confidence that you have that they found something in the second half of Carolina. So you can point to, hey, second half in Seattle, they were pretty good. First half in Arizona, first drive tonight was very good, but it is not a complete picture. And as they have to play tougher teams as we go on here forward, our teams that, yeah, teams that are tougher than a Cooper Rush led football team, it's just going to be a tough road for this Vikings team to prove themselves from here on out that they're in real contention without winning the next three in a row, which I think they really have to, to show that they can be a legitimate team. But I don't know how they do that with such inconsistency. Yeah. Inconsistency on, on the offensive side, occasionally on the defensive side and, you know, a, a play caller who is still figuring things out with a flawed quarterback. And, you know, sometimes the quarterback's going to be flawed. The play caller might be good. Well, then you still have one of the two that are flawed. Sometimes it'll be reversed. Um, and sometimes they'll both be flawed on the same night. I think that was tonight. Mm -hmm. Occasionally the stars will align and you'll have a second half like you did against Carolina where, you know, in that Carolina game, there was a catalyst, that block punt, which sort of woke the offense up. Boom. Oh, we got, we got to go. We can't mess around with Carolina. And they, they, to their credit, really put their foot on the gas tonight. After the Cedric Wilson touchdown, 73 yards to tie the game, first minute of the third quarter. If that doesn't wake you up mm -hmm. to, to realize that, oh, okay, I guess that Cooper Rush can catch lightning once in a while. We should probably end this now. If that's not going to wake you up, something's wrong. And this team just never came out of the doldrums. I mean, they, they go out with a whimper on the final drive, messing around with the clock, throwing the ball out of bounds on the final play with not even getting a throw into the end zone right. in a Hail Mary fashion, just a sad um, four of the first five drives in the second half were three and outs, I think. I mean, just no sign of life whatsoever. And even when they generated a field goal, it was because of three Dallas personal fouls. And what's really interesting too, on the defensive side, now the Vikings did not have any sort of 
horrendous performance, but they were able to slow down the run later in the game and force Cooper Rush to beat them. And then he did. And I, I think that normally you would say, well, if you've done that successfully and you've slowed down Tony Pollard and Ezekiel Elliott, well, you've got something for yourself. You'll probably win the game. Uh, but in the final drive, they had them backed up after a penalty and Ezekiel Elliott breaks a couple of tackles. And then Amari Cooper just mosses Cameron Dantzler in the end zone to win this game. And I, I feel like, Sam, what they've got here is a defense with a lot of very good pieces that plays overall mostly pretty well. And the numbers, I, I think, speak well of them as a defense on the whole, but it's not perfect. It's not a defense that you just win games with because you're you. For example, the you know 2017, they win a game in Atlanta, something like 13 to nine. Well, that's not quite this team. Uh, this team, I think, has a solid defense, but now there's also some concern about injuries because Patrick Peterson is out, and that was problematic for tonight. The receivers from Dallas were able to get open and make plays, probably way more open than even Cooper Rush found them uh, on a number of occasions, but also Daniil Hunter getting an MRI after the game. And we've always said this, Sam, that if Daniil Hunter goes out, Cooper Rush all of a sudden had time to throw the football. And Everson Griffin made some plays and had a good night. Uh, but aside from that, there weren't too many other people putting pressure on the quarterback. And so as we look forward, Daniil Hunter's health will be something to really watch. I don't think there's any real solution, though, to the cornerback issue of having Patrick Peterson out. No, it, it felt like the cornerbacks were, and perhaps by instruction, told to play a lot of off, keep things in front, force the drives to be long and and. I think that kind of worked. Like, I don't think that was a terrible strategy. The 2019 Vikings with a different, more seasoned cornerback unit sort of survived doing that for most of the season. So it's not not the worst strategy in the world, but um, in close games, it can expose you. And we saw Cameron Dantzler get victimized a lot by C.D. Lamb and Amari Cooper and Bashad Breeland has been spotty most of the year. And on the defensive line, I mean, DJ Wanham was once again a ghost in, in fill-in duty, and you traded Stephen Weatherly. The timing on that doesn't look great right now. Everson Griffin can only, only do so much by himself, and I, I am worried about a pretty quick trigger on the out designation for Daniil. I mean, they, they considered him out uh, at halftime, did not return, really leaving not a lot of room for optimism about that injury. I haven't seen the play that caused the injury, so I'm not sure really what we're dealing with here, but – uh, that is a huge concern for the Vikings going forward into, you know, taking on Baltimore and Lamar Jackson. You're going to need to to have your best on the defensive line. That's right. So as they go into now two serious road games, they could determine where they end up going with this season. Sam, uh, what do you think the pressure is now after a loss, not just a loss to Dallas? If this was Dak Prescott and they had lost 38-35, I think everyone walks out and goes, good game. And on to the next one, but Cooper Rush, national TV in your house. And by the way, the Vikings have more road games than home games this year. So they've got a lot of road trips left to go. Uh, where is the pressure right now on Mike Zimmer in this football team? Well, it's ratcheted up. You've burned through two winnable home games. And I've always said with this team, I mean, not just this year, but previous years, you have to take advantage at home because you're not as good of a road team. Those games are just tougher for this for this outfit for whatever reason so if you don't take advantage of winnable home games and you're forcing yourself to win on the road where it's much more difficult um i th i would have said that this coaching staff had a five percent chance of being like fired mid-season before the game and after watching that you know i still think it's unlikely but i think that the the percentages go up you know brad childress um i think got fired at three and six and hey this team is two losses away from that record and kind of falling out of contention and they're playing two really good teams that could put them to three and six. So I, I think my antenna would definitely go up at that point. And could this be the first domino to fall in a precipitous collapse for the Vikings out of the bye? And we've seen this team go like very extreme directions out of buys before. Mm -hmm. 2016 collapse, 2017, they've you know become the best in the NFL. So uh, this might be a bad omen coming out and playing like that against Dallas tonight. All right. For more rants and ramblings from us, check out the Purple Insider podcast and our written reactions at purpleinsider.substack.com. You can go there and subscribe. Make sure you subscribe to our videos as well, because you know it is going to continue to be nothing but interesting. 
covering the Minnesota Vikings. Matthew Collar, Sam Ekstrom. We will catch you next time here on Purple Insider Extra.